order. It being 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I just wish to advise the chamber that uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, uh, is uh, is detained in international calls that are running slightly over time. Uh, Minister Payne wishes to extend her apologies to the chamber. Um, uh, obviously, she will endeavour to be here as soon as possible, and I'm advised will be here uh, during this question time. Uh, if there are early questions for Senator Payne, then I will take them. But uh, but uh, otherwise, I thank the chamber for the understanding. Questions, Senator Sheldon, remotely. Well, my, no, thank you, um, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister confirm that less than 15 per cent of Australians aged 15 and over have been fully vaccinated in South West Sydney, which is one of the lowest vaccination rates in New South Wales? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the uh, the vaccination rollout continues to gather pace, Mr. President, and uh, as of uh, yesterday, over uh, 12 million Australians have had access uh, to. Uh, uh, there have been over 12 million doses of vaccine administered across the country. Uh, we continue to work collaboratively with the states to provide more opportunities for more Australians to access. The, uh, the vaccine, uh, and Senator we continue Colbeck, to grow Senator, the number. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. It was a very um, precise question, uh, which simply asked the minister to confirm a particular fact about South West Sydney vaccination rates. I have previously ruled that specific questions that are very factual um, will be interpreted very tightly when it comes to direct relevance. You've reminded the minister of the answer. I notice of the question, sorry. I notice he has been speaking for just over 30 seconds, uh, and I'll listen carefully to when he turning to the specific nature of the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, um, we continue to provide opportunities for, for Australians to access the vaccine, uh, and we continue to increase the number of outlets available to Australians to access the vaccine. Uh, Senator Wong on a, on a point of order. Senator Wong, Senator. Pete, I repeat, point of order, direct relevance. I repeat my previous point of order and point out that the minister is ignoring uh, your advice to him. I have been reluctant in my time in this role to do what happens in the other place, to call ministers to the specific nature of a question without a point of order being raised. I don't want to have to start making that habit. I think it interrupts the free flow of debate in the chamber. But, Minister, I am going to ask you to turn to the specific nature of what was a specifically worded question, um, rather than address the general terms of the vaccination policy. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, and in New South Wales, uh, as of 3 p.m. yesterday, uh, over 42% um, of the New South Wales population eligible for vaccination have received their first dose, and over 20%, Mr. President, are fully vaccinated. Mr. President, I don't have the specific details of a particular area of Sydney with me. Order, um, order, order. And Mr. President, over the last seven days, we have administered over 450,000 doses in New South Wales, uh, and as of the 3rd of August, uh, 4,139,773 doses have been administered in New South Wales. As I've said a number of times, Mr. President, we continue Order. to grow the pace of the vaccine rollout. We continue to grow the number of outlets available to Australians to access the uh, the vaccine uh, through uh, a number of various different Order. types of the time outlet. for the answer has expired. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Uh, can the minister confirm that in Logan Bow Desert, one of 11 local government areas in lockdown in southeast Queensland, only 13.2% of Australians are vaccinated, the third lowest rate in the nation? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I don't have specific details of a particular local government area with me, but Mr. President, 
uh, to assist the chamber uh, as at as Order. at uh, eleven fifty nine on the third of August. There have been two point three eight seven million doses administered in Queensland. Uh, over thirty eight percent of the Queensland population eligible for vaccination have received their first dose. Mr. President, and 19% are fully vaccinated. Uh, we continue to work closely with the Queensland Government to provide uh, both vaccines uh, and support the Queensland vaccination program. Uh, this week, uh, ending the 8th of August, the Commonwealth will provide Queensland with uh, just under 80,000 doses of Pfizer vaccine, uh, and there will be uh, also, 49,600 doses of AstraZeneca and over 47,000 doses Senator of Colby, Pfizer time vaccine. The answer the has expired. Senator, order. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Does the Morrison government take responsibility for such low vaccination rates? Senator Colbeck. Well, clearly, Mr. President, the government is responsible for the vaccine rollout and therefore takes responsibility um, for the current vaccinations that have occurred around Australia. Uh, but as I've said a number of times uh, and to the chamber, uh, and as the government has said on a number of occasions, as the supply of vaccine has increased, so have we included the uh, increased the the. Uh, capacity and the availability of, va of vaccine for the Australian people. Uh, we have continued to grow the number of vaccines applied uh, to Australians over recent weeks. In fact, the last two million uh, vaccines to be administered have taken less than six, six, uh, six days on each of those occasions. So the, the rate of the rollout continues to grow. The number of outlets available for Australians to access the vaccine continue to grow. And we continue to have the objective of making available to all Australians a vaccine who want one by, by the end of this Colbeck. year. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is working towards the goal of ending violence against women and their children? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question on this extraordinarily important subject. The Morrison government is absolutely focused on making Australia a place that is free from violence against women and their children. We demonstrated our commitment to this, um, ending violence against uh, women, domestic, family and sexual violence against women in the 21-22 budget, where we made the largest ever commitment to women's safety with our $1.1 billion package. This absolutely historic package is a key measure uh, that will contribute to the towards zero target that this government is absolutely committed to. Importantly, the package is also a down payment on the next national plan, not only to reduce violence but to end violence against women and their children. And working towards this important goal, the next national plan absolutely must be an ambitious blueprint to stop the rot that is family, domestic and sexual violence across our national landscape. It will not only build on the previous work of the previous national plan, but it will respond to urgent new issues uh, that we're facing today and build a base for emerging issues that are likely to occur into the future. The, up and, uh, the upcoming Women's Safety Summit on the 6th and 7th of September this year will be a critical step in the development of this new plan. The summit provides us with an opportunity to shine a light on the terrible violence that women from all walks of life experience in Australia. It will discuss key issues of women's safety, including financial security, policing and justice responses, sexual violence and the challenges facing diverse members of the Australian community. The two-day program also includes a series of roundtables that will inform the consultation process as we work towards developing the next national plan. Um, by bringing together a cross-section of Australian community, the voices of all Australians will have the opportunity to be heard. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that update. Minister, can you please outline the other measures the government is implementing to support Australians who are escaping family and domestic violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we have a number of measures that we're putting in place. Um, 
that because we believe first and foremost that when women are making the brave decision to escape a violent situation um, that they need to have a safe place to go. And that is why um, we're providing $144 million for the escaping violence payment and we have provided uh, $72.6 million for the Safe Places program across the country. The Escaping Violence program will provide immediate access to funds uh, for women and children when they flee a violent situation to allow them to pay for such things, so whether it might be school fees, a rental bond or the like. As Safe Places funding uh, bolsters the already $1.6 billion that's provided in housing and homelessness funding uh, to make sure that we have new emergency accommodation to be built specifically for women escaping violence. Safe Places will help uh, nearly 6,500 women and children every year, not just in metropolitan areas but across rural and regional Australia as well. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, could you please advise how the government is helping to improve responses for victims of sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, recently I visited the Monash University Department of Forensic Medicine, which had received $4.5 million from uh, the government to develop and implement Australia's first accredited training course for health practitioners and frontline workers uh, to improve their responses to sexual violence victims. So participants in the courses that are being run uh, by Monash University will learn how to identify risk factors and respond to disclosures in sensitive and appropriate ways. It's absolutely vital that when someone discloses an experience of sexual violence, their disclosure is handled with care and appropriately. So we believe by um, arming uh, tr and training healthcare professionals with the kind of expertise so that they can understand uh, the signs and the symptoms and the risks that are associated with violence, we can assist many, many more people. And I want to take this opportunity to urge anyone who needs support to call 1800 RESPECT at any time of the day. Senator O'Neill. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister confirm that under Mr Morrison's latest announcement, Australians will continue to face lockdowns even with 70 per cent of the eligible population vaccinated? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Senator Colbeck, I think you're on mute. Are you on mute? No, we, we're having a... Yes, I, I was on mute. My you. apologies, Mr. President. Apologies to the chair. We start the. Oh, cool. Great. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, and and I can confirm that at the rate of seventy percent of the eligible population being vaccinated, there is still some scope for lockdowns under the Doherty Institute modelling, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, the modelling contemplates those sorts of circumstances occurring um, as a part of the development of the phased phase plan for reopening the economy, Mr President. So there are a number of targets uh, that, are, that talk about uh, the progressive rates of vaccination within the country increasing uh, to provide more and more freedoms. That's the point of the exercise, Mr. President, so that the Australian community can understand the circumstances under which they might enjoy more freedoms. Uh, the circumstances by which governments, state, territory and Commonwealth may make decisions about reopening the economy and the community, Mr. President. That is the point of the government commissioning the Doherty modelling so that that information about those circumstances would be clear to the Australian people. So it is contemplated that there still could be lockdowns under those circumstances, Mr President, uh, and particularly as we see new variants to the COVID-19 um, coming into uh, circulation, those circumstances may change, as they have done throughout the pandemic, Mr President, and we will have to be prepared, as we have done so far, to adjust to those new variants and the new circumstances. Uh, but the Doherty Institute modelling has been put in place so Australians have a full understanding of the circumstances about reopening the community and the economy. 
Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm that under Mr. Morrison's latest announcement, Australians will continue to face lockdowns even with 80 per cent of the eligible population vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Well, again, Mr. President, uh, that is contemplated in the Doherty modelling. Uh, the Doherty modelling talks about when at least 80 per cent of the adult population is fully vaccinated, we, we can consider transition to phase C, which is regarded in the, in the, um, the plan as the vaccination consolidation phase. Uh, measures may include minimum ongoing baseline restrictions adjusted to minimise cases without lockdowns and highly targeted lockdowns only. Mr. President, the whole purpose of this uh, vaccination process and the plan is to minimise serious illness, hospital, hospitalisations and fatalities as a part of the plan. But Mr. President, we are going to have to continue to be prepared to adjust uh, as we have been throughout the pandemic as new variants to the virus have occurred, uh, Mr. President. So, yes, there are lockdowns Order. contemplated, Senator targeted Colbeck, lockdowns. time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. When asked yesterday, Minister, what date the 70 per cent target will be reached, uh, you said, and I quote, the government deliberately has not established a date for that to occur. Why is the Morrison government keeping Australians in the dark? Is it because Mr Morrison doesn't want to take responsibility for meeting his own targets? Here, here, Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I completely reject the insinuation by the question. Mr President, we want all Australians to front up and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Reaching the targets and putting the targets into the public domain is putting the power into reopening the economy back into the hands of Australians. That's the point of it. Australians can understand what the thresholds are for the reopening of the economy, uh, and they can then Order. work towards meet, meeting the targets. Our responsibility, Mr President, the responsibility of the government is to make available the vaccine and make, av make available as many as possible outlets for Australians Order. to access the vaccine. That Senator is our responsibility, Mr President. So we deliberately haven't set a target. Um, we, we make no apology for that. But Australians now know the circumstances Order, Senator that Colbert. we can open the time for the answer has expired. Senator Hanson-Young. Mr President, my question is to Senator Birmingham representing the Prime Minister. Last week, Sky News was banned from YouTube for spreading COVID-19 medical misinformation. Sky is broadcast on subscription and free-to-air television. What is the Morrison government doing to prevent the spread of COVID misinformation on our TV screens? And what's the role of the government's television and media regulator? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson-Young uh, for her question. Uh, the provision of, uh, of accurate information in relation uh, to uh, Order. all health matters, but particularly in relation to COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, uh, is particularly uh, important. Uh, the, uh, the government uh, is investing in communications to ensure that uh, accurate, timely information is provided to Australians to give them reassurance about the facts uh, around the COVID-19 vaccine uh, availability uh, about the safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines as well. Now, those information measures that the government undertakes are important means of communicating uh, with the Australian people, along with indeed the support provided uh, by many, uh, by many, be they by uh, many in the media, uh, be they by many uh, in public life, uh, even uh, people like the member for Maribyrnong, I note, have been uh, quite uh, quite vocal in their. Uh, uh, information provision in relation to, uh, to uh, vaccines, including the AstraZeneca vaccine, and I welcome that. I welcome that, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, our media regulators are empowered under uh, Australian laws to uh, to act uh, where necessary. Uh, they have clear processes in place in uh, in relation to uh, to the way in which uh, they respond to complaints, conduct investigations, and respond to such matters. 
Uh, those processes uh, don't involve um, political interference, uh, but uh, I am happy to uh, seek any further information in terms of uh, actions those regulators may be taking that could be provided to the Chamber. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rennick and George Christensen. PM, uh, MP, both members of the Morrison government have made several statements that have been flagged by online platforms like Facebook because they contradict medical advice and undermine medical experts. What is the Prime Minister doing to stop the spread of COVID misinformation from those sabotaging his own health response? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. Uh, I thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Mr President, uh, as I indicated before, the government uh, takes very seriously the importance of ensuring uh, accurate, timely information uh, is provided to Australians, providing them with reassurance uh, about uh, the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, the safety, the efficacy uh, of those vaccines. You know, I restate in this place the very thorough process that Australia went through, unlike other parts of the world where there were uh, emergency listings that shortcut uh, regulatory approvals. In Australia, we went through uh, the thorough processes of the Therapeutic Goods Administration to ensure uh, the safety of vaccines. Uh, in this country, uh, we have uh, developed the type of modelling that you've heard from Senator Colbeck uh, outlines very clearly the efficacy of those vaccines. Uh, the fact that, uh, that be they uh, the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, they reduce the rate of serious uh, illness and indeed death uh, by up to 90 per cent for each Order. of them. Senator Birmingham. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. YouTube has a policy that it, quote, doesn't allow content that spreads medical misinformation about COVID, that contradicts medical information about COVID-19 from local health authorities or the World Health Organization. It seems that YouTube has higher standards for facts and truth than this government. What, is, what are you doing to stop those sabotaging your health response who are members of your own government. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, I make clear that, uh, that false information shared online can create public confusion. It can be harmful and can, can, uh, can create uh, difficulties for vulnerable people in our community. Uh, that is why, as, uh, as a government, uh, we have developed a uh, code of practice on disinformation and misinformation. Uh, it is uh, it's why, indeed, uh, we have uh, regulatory processes in place that I spoke about before. And as I indicated, uh, I will bring back to the chamber any information in terms of uh, regulatory actions underway. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Could the minister describe how the Services Australia is supporting Australians in the current lockdowns? The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askey for that question. And indeed, I'm delighted to uh, answer this question. Services Australia is truly the engine room of government support to all Australians. Throughout this pandemic, the Morrison government has ensured that services are delivered seamlessly and efficiently when and where they are needed most by Australians. We've quickly and efficiently bolstered the Australian Immunisation Register and MyGov. We've applied fast-moving Centrelink payment changes and supported much-needed telehealth items through the MBS. We've also paused debt raising and recovery in lockdown areas of New South Wales and Queensland. But when we make policy decisions, it's Services Australia that are on the receiving end of thousands, in fact hundreds of thousands of claims, phone calls and questions. They're setting and now regularly breaking their own records for social security and welfare telephony and processing channels and also now for digital claims. This year, in the past two months alone, they have approved over 1.4 million COVID disaster payments during these current lockdowns, totalling $1.33 billion, and they're supporting over 900,000 Australians. Yesterday alone, more than 1,600 income support customers in New South Wales who have lost more than eight hours' work applied for the additional support payment. Colleagues, Mr President, there are so many ways to serve our nation, be they in or out of uniform. And on behalf of all Australians, I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure yours, all Services Australia staff for their unwavering focus 
and urgency and momentum towards supporting Australians doing natural disasters. Their work is sometimes an unsung service to the nation, and I know many Australians are very grateful for their service. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how have Services Australia had to adapt to meet demand? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, at every stage of the pandemic, the Morrison government has adjusted to support Australians and ensure that services are delivered seamlessly, efficiently and as quickly as we can. Service Australia have mobilised more than 18,000 internal and external staff uh, to ensure that calls and claims for the COVID-19 disaster payment are processed as quickly as possible. And in some cases, that has been as quickly being in the bank in 40 uh, minutes. So what does this mobilisation look like? It includes over 600 new staff, uh, over 250 APS surge staff from other departments and also other agencies. Over 4,000 agency staff who usually undertake other roles have been redeployed to this effort. And over 13,000 staff from the customer service delivery group who are prioritising the COVID-19 disaster payment at this time. And can I again thank them for their efforts and their work in stepping up and Order. supporting all Senator Australians. Reynolds. Senator ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how has the Liberal and Nationals government communicated support available to impacted communities? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. The Morrison government is indeed here to support all Australians, uh, and that also includes our cold communities. And we do understand the challenges faced by many of these communities, particularly in Western Sydney at the moment. Our government, through Services Australia, is ensuring that information is available on support is accessible to all Australians, with content now translated into 63 different languages to help uh, many of those communities. Multicultural service officers are also working directly with the community, and also they do in-language interviews have been made available to provide information about this payment. The payment is available to Australian residents and eligible working visa uh, holders who meet the eligible criteria. People can also call 131202 to talk to Services Australia in languages other than English. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In his announcement on the 2nd of July during the Delta outbreak in Sydney, Mr Morrison declared that in phase B, and I quote, lockdowns would only occur in extreme circumstances. Given Mr Morrison's announcement last Friday, can the minister confirm this statement is no longer true? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President. Mr President, uh, um, as uh, uh, all senators and all Australians have the opportunity uh, following the release of the uh, Doherty Institute modelling yesterday, uh, people are able to see uh, both the content of that modelling uh, the way in which the modelling uh, outlines the uh, impact of different vaccination levels uh, on expected rates of transmission uh, and on expected rates of contraction of COVID-19 uh, and on the seriousness of the consequences of, uh, of that and how that shifts at different levels uh, of vaccination uh, across the population. Uh, it also outlines uh, different phases of restrictions that could be applied at those different, uh, different rates. Uh, it is correct, uh, Mr President, that, uh, that in terms of uh, the different phases of moving through, uh, variations in terms of the types of restrictions that may be necessary at different levels uh, were made to make sure uh, that we could have an appropriately staged approach at the different levels of, uh, of vaccination through the, uh, through the modelling. This, Mr President, is, uh, is entirely consistent with an approach uh, of seeking to follow scientific and medical advice in the handling of the pandemic. Mr President, uh, what, uh, what the government has done in terms of uh, seeking to chart a pathway of reopening is listen to that scientific and medical advice. And we're one of the few countries in the world to have had the opportunity, to have had the opportunity to be able to take Order. that advice and adapt policy along the way according to that advice and information, some of the best practice in the world. And one of the few countries in the world to have that opportunity to do so. Uh, and that is because as a country, notwithstanding the many difficulties and uncertainties in responding to a global pandemic, we have been 
uh, in a position where lives have been saved, where we have been able to act in accordance with advice and where we are able to make sure that we get it right before we move to those next stages. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, in his announcement on 2 July, in the midst of a Delta outbreak, Mr Morrison declared that in phase C there would be, and I quote, no lockdowns. Can the minister confirm that this is not true and that in phase C Australians will in fact be subjected to more lockdowns in a whole range of circumstances? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, I'd refer the senator to the answer I just gave and to the answer that Senator Colbeck gave previously. Uh, the Order. answer I just gave, Mr President, Order. outlined very clearly the fact uh, that, uh, that the government outlined uh, the potential stages uh, for reopening. The government asked the Doherty Institute uh, to undertake modelling against those sorts of, uh, of processes. In the process of undertaking that Order. modelling, in the process of undertaking that modelling, Mr. President, uh, it became apparent uh, that there needed to be differences in those stages uh, to be able to work successfully through uh, reopening. The government fully expects that. That's why the government was asking for expert advice. It's why we have done so. Uh, now, uh, as Senator Colbeck said before, uh, the advice as published makes clear uh, that in the third phase, limited targeted lockdowns may be necessary in certain extreme circumstances and that uh, and that indeed uh, Order, is Senator there Birmingham, in that public time advice. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher a final supplementary question. Thank you I do have one. <laughs> Last year Mr Morrison and his ministers consistently criticized the Victorian lockdown and this year he has gone from urging Victoria to lift restrictions and commending New South Wales for not going into full lockdown in June to declaring in July that, and I quote, lockdowns are absolutely necessary and there's no other way through. How can Australians possibly believe a word Mr Morrison says? Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Some, sometimes when I stand here and look opposite, I'm not sure whether I'm seeing a whole world of Nostradamuses across, uh, across from me uh, or people who just think that they have the wonderful benefit of 2020 Order. hindsight. But Mr, but Mr President, you know, a point, a point, a very obvious Order. point, Sorry, a very Senator. obvious Order. point, a very Senator obvious Birmingham. point that was missing on my from left. Senator Gallagher's question was any recognition of the reality of the existence of the Delta variant. 100 per cent, a 100 per cent Order. increase in the transmissibility of COVID-19 is a factor in relation to the Delta variant. Having a change that results in a 100 per cent increase Senator in the Birmingham potential rate of transmission— Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Order. I can barely hear Senator Birmingham. I, and he does have a loud voice. Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Thank you. The Leader of the Government is misleading. I did, That's link, not a point I did of order. mention the Delta outbreak, Mr That's President. not a point of order, Senator it's Gallagher. It's misleading to order. say that. There's an opportunity to debate answers after question time. We, are, we have got senators operating remotely. I ask again for the courtesy of the Senate to allow them to hear it, because if I can't, they can't. Senator Birmingham. No, Mr President, the fact is the fact is the circumstances we face now are quite different to the circumstances we faced as a country 12 months ago. At the time of the Victorian lockdown last Senator year. Senator Watt, order on a, order on my left. Senator Pratt, Senator Watt, your leader's on her feet. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. I would point out that this question does relate to comments made when the Delta variant um, the, was already in place in Wong, Sydney. Senator Wong, Senator you Wong, order, order. Senator Wong, please. It was a very broadly worded question. The minister is entirely in order in answering it in these terms. I am going to ask for silence. I do not want to have to stand or interrupt question time further. Senator Birmingham. Simple point, Mr. President, is when the facts and the evidence change, we have been willing to change with the facts and the changes in evidence. And those opposite would be the first to criticise us if we didn't. Order. Senator Patterson. Senator Pratt. Senator Wong. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Selger. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government is delivering a technology, not taxes, approach to reduce Australia's carbon emissions while also securing our energy needs and making electricity more affordable? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, our government is absolutely committed to a technology-led approach to reducing emissions and securing affordable and reliable energy for Australian households and business. Now, we know that those opposite believe that taxes are always the answer, but we don't agree. Uh, we have a different approach, and I'm pleased to advise the Senate that our approach is working. Now, I'm hearing from George again. It's hard to hear him though through the, through the mask, so I'll do my best to push on. Australia's emissions are now lower than in any year under the previous Labor government. And at the lowest level since 1990, we've reduced emissions uh, by 20 per cent on 2005 levels, and we're on track to meet and beat our 2030 commitments. Now, emissions in the NEM have fallen to their lowest level since records began, and our technology, not taxes, approach has seen a record 7 gig of new renewable capacity installed last year alone. Now, Australia now has the highest total amount of solar PV capacity per person in the world. Of course, we still have no idea what Labor's 2030 emissions target is. We just know that whatever the problem, taxes are always Labor's solution. It is in their DNA. So on this side, we understand uh, that to continue to drive down emissions uh, while securing our economy from the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to tap into the expertise of agencies we already have, like ARENA, to support Australian innovation. And that's why we've introduced updated ARENA regulations after the Labor Greens coalition uh, voted against investment in clean and low emissions technology. Now, we will enable ARENA to invest in the five priority low emissions technologies identified in the technology investment roadmap clean hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, long duration storage, green steel and aluminium and healthy soils. All things it seems that the Labor Party and the Greens are against and the 1,400 jobs uh, that would come with them. We have a very different approach and Order. it is on Senator stark Sussel, display when we vote on the these regulations. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on why it is so critical for Australian businesses and households that we pursue a technology and not taxes approach when it comes to meeting Australia's energy needs. Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Senator Patterson. We know that it's technology, not taxes, that will drive down emissions, while at the same time creating jobs and ensuring we have the affordable, reliable energy we need. And that's why we've introduced these new arena regulations to enable more investment in the technologies is identified uh, in the investment roadmap, the technologies we need to ensure reliable and dispatchable power. Yet Labor and the Greens want to block these investments in clean energy technology and the jobs they will create. It's hard to comprehend, but it is happening. So perhaps it's time the Leader of the Opposition, instead of sneaking, the, sneaking into coal mines in Queensland, should take the advice of the member for Hunter, who last week said, Labor should just back whatever the government puts on the table. To do otherwise is to suggest we are not genuinely committed to action on climate change. Well, the member for Hunter is right. The member for Hunter is right, and the leader of the opposition is wrong because Labor doesn't Order. support Senator technology Seselja, because they time simply for the want has expired. More. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what measures the government is carrying out to deliver affordable, reliable, and more secure energy? And is he aware of any risks to this approach? Senator Seselja. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, and there are serious risks to our technology, not taxes, plan to deliver more affordable and reliable energy for all Australians while at the same time reducing emissions. And most of them are over there. Now, by teaming up with the Greens to block Arena's expansion, Labor is saying no to investment in the same low emissions technologies they claim to support. They voted for higher emissions fewer jobs and less funding for ARENA and apparently will do so again unless common sense prevails. The Labor Party doesn't know where they stand on technology, but we all know exactly where they stand on taxes. Taxes are Labor's track record. Now, the member for McMahon, of course, when he was in government, he increased the carbon tax. It wasn't high enough. He increased it. We all remember his housing tax, his car tax, his retiree tax. The choice is clear. There are only two ways to reduce emissions 
And if it isn't technology, it's taxes. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my uh, question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. In September 2018, the government launched the National Forest Industry Plan, a commitment to, uh, to Australia's timber industry and an investment in Australia's future. It included a commitment to, to plant a billion new plantation trees. Minister Littleproud said Australia will need to plant a billion new trees over the next decade to meet demands in 2050, particularly saw logs for building and construction. Now, is there an implementation program for this plan? How many uh, of the billion trees were supposed to be have been planted by this point in time, by the, uh, June the 30th, and how many have actually been planted? The minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the senator uh, for his question and for the notice he gave that allowed me to get um, the most up-to-date advice on this topic. And I'd like to thank uh, Senator Dunningham for that. I want to say um, how vital the forestry industry is. I'm from a timber town, Marysville, uh, in Victoria, and it underpins the lives and livelihoods of so many Australians. Whether it's in my own home state of Victoria, the Green Triangle, uh, in your home state of South Australia, or along that uh, western border, or the southwest slopes of New South Wales, or down to uh, the fantastic timber industry of Tasmania. Uh, forest products are an integral part of so many rural economies. After all, timber is the ultimate renewable resource. Beautiful, natural, strong and replantable. It surpasses none other. Not to mention to the benefit uh, of the environment regarding carbon sequestration. The Liberal National Government is committed to working with landholders, businesses, state and territory governments and industry to grow the forestry industry and the plant Australian plantation estate. We, unlike those on the other side, except uh, perhaps uh, Senator uh, Ciccone, uh, absolutely want to grow this industry, grow the number of people it employs, uh, grow uh, what we believe is a renewable and sustainable industry for us that is also good for the environment. We'll always listen to their views, and that's why we partner with them. It's important that we do acknowledge the issues we've faced. Timber sh supply shortages are affecting countries worldwide, order. and Australia oh, is Senator no exception. Mackenzie, I have Senator Patrick on a point of order. Senator Patrick, Rem on, on relevance, I did ask for the number of trees that were supposed to be, have been planted and the number of trees that have actually been planted. Uh, they were the points at the end of the question with a preamble. I'll listen carefully to the minister. Um, you reminded the minister of that part of the question, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you. Um, the issues that we're um, speaking about, about timber supply shortages, you mentioned how vital um, timber is uh, for construction. And as I travel around rural and regional Australia, um, timber shortages are actually becoming an impediment for uh, housing construction in some of those regional communities. And so we're no exception. There is a, a worldwide shortage of timber. These issues stem Order, from an Senator increase McKenzie. in demand Time for, for the timber answer construction. Has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you. I'm, I'm very surprised uh, you don't know the answer to this because you did ask the question on, uh, on notice, and it's only 2,800 hectares. That is about 2.8 million uh, trees that have been planted. That's less than 1 per cent of the target. What's the issue? What's the plan to move ahead? Why are you not coming anywhere near the objectives of this plan of a billion trees? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, so it's also important to note that our forestry states are estates are managed by state and territory governments. The Commonwealth does not manage a single tree in any productive forest. And we're working very, very hard, as I said, with state and territory governments, with industry, to expand our forestry um, estate. I understand uh, that in Tasmania, the most recent reports the softwood estate expanded by 2,000 hectares, and in Tasmania there are an average of 1,100 trees per hectare. That equates to an expansion of approximately 
million trees. In addition, I've been advised that there are currently two contractors working on over 900 hectares of plantation, meaning that almost another million trees are going into the ground, as I understand it. In New South Wales, um, where the bushfires were most significant, over 100,000 hectares, which equates to over 100 million trees, were lost during those fires. Last year, 4,500 hectares were Order, planted and another 7,000 hectares Time for the are currently expired. being Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you mentioned uh, the shortage of, uh, so, uh, of a uh, 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 blog in, uh, in your answer. Um, is it not in Australia's interest to prohibit the export of, uh, of, of trees in circumstances where our own mills are desperate to get log? Uh, is that something that is being considered by the government? Senator McKenzie. Thank you. And, and you're right. Um, demand is high. Supply is restrained for a whole raft of reasons, one of them being bushfires, other um, being logging uh, bans in certain jurisdictions of certain areas. But as a federal government, we'll always work with industry to help them grow, and that includes ensuring that we have as much in-country value as, po add as possible. And that means uh, we'll take our lead from them about what's best for the future. We want to keep and create uh, more timber jobs than the 52,000 Australians that are already employed in the sector. Um, I think when you look at export measures to prevent the export of timber, our approach is actually about expanding the domestic industry as home as quickly as possible in partnership with the states uh, and with industries. You know and I know um, that that means helping bushfire-affected sawmills upgrade and update their processing facilities through the recent $40 million bushfire program, meaning they could do more here in Australia rather than sending those Order, raw Senator products McKenzie. offshore. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, and I note the answers uh, Senator Birmingham gave to Senator Hanson-Young's questions earlier. In an episode of Steve Bannon's War Room, Coalition Senator Canavan criticised the public health advice of governments, including his own, stating that even if they released full public health advice, it would be a, quote, dog's breakfast. Senator Canavan has also repeatedly called to end the lockdowns on social media as recently as the last two days. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Canavan? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I've uh, I've not uh, seen. I'm not sure I've actually even heard of the podcast that you're speaking of, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, but in terms of at least the remarks as you characterise them, the answer is no. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. On the 18th of July, Coalition Senator Rennick shared and endorsed an article on Facebook challenging the TGA's approval of an unnamed COVID vaccine described as, and I quote an experimental gene therapy vaccine with plummeting efficacy, significant short-term safety signals and unknown long-term side effects. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Rennick and will the government's code of practice on COVID disinformation apply to its own MPs and senators? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the government has complete confidence in the work of the TGA and backs it completely. Senator Watt. Order. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Well, I'm glad Senator Birmingham backs the TGA more than he backs his own MPs. Mr George Christensen's Facebook yesterday received the fourth most interactions of all federal politicians, and he represents a region with one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country at only 10.2%. Mr Christensen regularly uses his Facebook to undermine the use of lockdowns and restrictions, saying they had actually caused deaths in Australia. How can Australians be expected to do the right thing when Mr Morrison's own members are encouraging them to ignore the Prime Minister's Order. own public Senator health Watt. advice? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Order. Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, it's, it's no secret. It's no secret that there are Order. some Australians. Order. Some Australians Sorry, who disagree order. with Sorry. lockdowns Senator or certain Watt, public Senator policy Rennick. measures that have been Senator taken Watt and during Rennick. the course of the pandemic. Uh, however, however, Mr President, it is clear that the government wants as many Australians as order. possible to get vaccinated. And in terms of Australians, I thank them for the fact that they are responding in record numbers to the request to get vaccinated. They are responding in record numbers with yesterday some 213,947 Australians Watt. turning out to have another dose of vaccine administered. 
Those, uh, those numbers have driven the total number of vaccine doses administered to more than 12.8 million across Australia. They've got us to the point where some 42 per cent of all eligible Australians over the age of 16 have had order. their first Senator dose. Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. This goes to Mr Christensen. At what point are you going to actually deal with him? Senator Wong, the point of order. I, I, I'm not sure if that was a point of order, um, because the last part of the question was a very broad one, and I think the minister's got a lot of discretion in answering it and remaining directly relevant. Senator Birmingham is in order. Senator Birmingham, order. And Mr. President, as we uh, as we acknowledge those over 70s, of whom nearly 80% have now received uh, the first dose of vaccine, order. and we Senator encourage all Birmingham, Australians to follow to that lead of our seniors. Order. Senator Watt, if you ask a question, you should listen to the answer. Well, there were a lot of interjections, and I was struggling to hear Senator Birmingham during that. Senator Watt, please. Senator, Sen Senator Wong, there is a time for debate. My job is not to judge it, but to ensure senators can participate. Senator, Sc Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's support to the rollout of vaccines to combat COVID-19 in Australia's region, including in the Pacific? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Scar for his question. Australia is standing strongly with our partners in uh, the Pacific and in Southeast Asia in their response to COVID-19. We are delivering on the Prime Minister's commitment to the G7 to provide up to 20 million vaccines for our neighbours, including 15 million to the Pacific and Timor-Leste and 5 million to Southeast Asia. To date, we've delivered over 1 million vaccine doses to eight countries, to Papua New Guinea, to Timor-Leste, to Fiji, the Solomon Islands, Tuvalu, Samoa, Tonga and most recently to Vanuatu. Our contribution of Australian vaccines complements the $623 million we've committed to vaccine access, including end-to-end -end support for the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Our Pacific Flights program is sustaining air connectivity to the Pacific and Timor-Leste, ensuring those life-saving vaccines and medical equipment are delivered. In our closest neighbour, Papua New Guinea, we're strongly supporting the government's campaign to lift vaccination rates. We're partnering with churches, businesses and NGOs to promote vaccination positive messages. The ADF is providing vital logistic support to PNG's vaccination campaign in the Torres Strait border region. In Fiji, our regular supply of vaccines, ANSMAT teams, PPE and medical equipment has been vital to assist our partners in Fiji to address a very difficult Delta variant COVID-19 surge. I've been in regular contact with my counterparts on these matters. I met with Pacific Islands Forum Foreign Ministers last week. Uh, today I've met with ASEAN Foreign Ministers and spoken with Cook Islands Prime Minister Mark Brown, Tuvalu Foreign Minister Simon Coffey. Our assistance through these vital partnerships is genuinely saving lives and genuinely helping to stem very, very lethal outbreaks. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise on the broader support Australia is providing to our region to strengthen health security? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Australia is also investing in our region's health systems, in health governance, in specialist clinical services and training. Last financial year, we provided $228 million for regional health programs in the Pacific. In Papua New Guinea, for example, we're working with local partners to provide high-quality integrated sexual and reproductive health, family planning and maternal and child health services, partnering with New Zealand and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, to build health system capacity to increase routine immunisation coverage. Australia has supported the establishment of a new ASEAN centre for public health emergencies and emerging diseases, which was part of my discussions with ASEAN foreign ministers today, uh, which delayed my attendance in the chamber. Uh, Mr President, for that, my apologies and uh, apologies to colleagues. Our Pacific Medicines Testing Program is a foundational initiative within our Pacific Step Up. It boosts public safety through the testing of the quality and safety of medicines used in the Pacific by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. No need for the minister to apologise for engaging with our ASEAN friends. Uh, can the minister outline Australia's assistance to the region to transition from COVID-19 response to longer-term recovery? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. It's fair to say that our region faces an unprecedented economic shock from COVID-19. 
The Asian Development Bank has cut its growth forecasts for the Pacific from 1.4 per cent just in April of this year to 0.3 per cent. So Australia is implementing our $500 million package in new economic development and security measures to support Southeast Asia's recovery from COVID-19. We're delivering on our commitment through the Mekong Australia Partnership and our Partnerships for Infrastructure initiative. And our, COVID, and our Pacific COVID-19 response package is providing essential services, flight connectivity and increased social spending. In Fiji, we provided over $83 million last financial year in fiscal support, directly benefiting Fijians impacted by COVID-19. This complements the Fiji government's important poverty benefits scheme and disability allowance for women, for children, for other vulnerable groups. These initiatives are key to supporting the region's resilience and recovery from COVID-19. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications, and Regional Education and Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. I refer to Senator McKenzie's statements this week defending her oversight of discretionary grants programs. The Minister has previously told the Senate about the Community Sport Infrastructure Program that, and I quote, the Prime Minister did not have a role in authorising projects throughout the three rounds and the final decision maker was me. Can the Minister, minister explain how on the eve of the last federal election, her approved project list was changed at the request of the Prime Minister's office without her knowledge. I'll call Senator McKenzie without reading out multiple titles. Senator McKenzie. <laughs> yes, you need a PhD to read it as well. Um, well thank you, Senator Chisholm, for your um, question. I submitted a 6,000 word statement to the Senate inquiry into these matters. Indeed, I appeared in a once in 120 year event of the Senate calling uh, one of its own members to appear to a committee to provide uh, answers to your questions, which I did happily because I respect the work of the Senate and the order. integral role Senator, it plays McKenzie, in our democracy. Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, uh, and I have risen uh, at 1.32 and if the minister proceeds to answer the question. Obviously, my point of order will be withdrawn, but I didn't want her to sit down before I made this point of order. And I'm going to ask you if the minister uses that excuse to avoid any answer and question time to take advice on the clerk and to come back. It is not in order, nor consistent with the standing orders, for a minister simply to say, I wrote a big statement and thereby avoid any further questions. I will take further advice on this. I always am happy to and to come back to senators individually or collectively. The question is in order because it refers the minister to a previous statement that is within the standing order. However, a minister, in my view, can refer to a previous statement in, a, in answering that without necessarily detailing what is in that statement. If I have any change to that advice, I will report it to the senators involved individually or to the chamber if it is, is of grave interest. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And you know, I have never avoided answering those questions in those public forums uh, ad nauseum. So I actually have nothing further to add to my public commentary, including answering that specific Order. question Order. during the Senate inquiry uh, that Order. Senator Chisholm chaired. He had over an hour to ask me any question he liked on that day in addition to the 6,000-word public statement. Uh, so I'm very comfortable Order. with the management of that program. I'm very comfortable with the exercise of ministerial discretion that saw more projects delivered to Labor seats than if I had of not exercised my ministerial discretion. More clubs right around the country uh, were able to avail themselves of a highly popular program that was oversubscribed to the tune of 13 times. Uh, those programs were helping local clubs to increase physical activity right around the country in a whole raft of sports. So um, I have publicly dealt with this through a whole raft of mechanisms that this chamber avails it of, of itself um, to provide accountability and transparency to the public on the spending of public monies. I stand by those public comments uh, and I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The Minister has also told the Senate, and I quote, the Prime Minister's office was not responsible for altering the attachment to the round three brief. 
because the brief was submitted to Sport Australia, albeit not in a timely manner, from my office. How can the Senate reconcile the minister's claim that Prime Minister had no role in sports rorts when his office was adding and deleting projects without her knowledge? Senator Mackenzie. Again, these questions have been asked and answered. I, prefer, I refer you to both the statement and the Hansard uh, on both these accounts. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Given the minister yesterday listed a number of grants programs in her new roles that she is now the decision maker for, will she ensure the Prime Minister's office does not repeat the previous practice of altering the minister's grant decisions? Senator Mackenzie. I have a raft of grant programs under my authority and discretion as is appropriate as a Minister for the Crown. I will actually undertake my role as a Minister for the Crown as a Senator uh, with personal integrity and intent and ensure that I fulfil my duties uh, in accordance with both the ministerial standards and the way I have uh, conducted myself order. throughout Senator my career. Wong, order. Point of order. The, the, issue, the question didn't go to this minister's appropriateness, on which we all have very different views. It went to whether or not she was going to ensure the Prime Minister's office did not repeat their previous practice of altering her grant decisions. Um, you restated the question. Um, the minister's been talking for 21 seconds. If the minister is limiting her comments, as I believe she is, to her administration of the programs, I can't go to the point of actually directing her how to answer a question. She is being directly relevant. There's an opportunity after question time, as I repeat, for debate of questions and answers. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, I take full responsibility for all decisions made uh, as a minister both then and I'll continue to do so. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Payne. Sorry. Penny. Yep, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank the Senate for uh, the opportunity to make this uh, brief statement, and I seek leave to do so. Sorry, leave is granted. Sorry, I'll speak to the Deputy President. President, uh, Mr. President, and colleagues, when Australians first heard of the explosion at the port of Beirut, uh, it was a incomprehensible disaster. The mobile phone videos of the sudden explosion with its massive white shockwave were truly horrifying. The detonation was so large that it registered on the global detection network of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation. More than 215 people died, more than 7,000 were injured and more than 300,000 were displaced because their very homes were completely lost. Lebanon has not recovered from its grief nor from its damage. And that day also took the life of an Australian citizen, two-year-old Isaac Olers. Today, we remember Isaac, and we once more offer a deep and sincere condolences to his parents, Sarah and Craig, and their families in their immeasurable grief. Mr. President, Australia once more reiterates our strong and unequivocal support for a full, credible and transparent investigation into the explosion, and for those responsible to be held to account for acts of omission, commission or corruption. Tonight, Australia will participate in the third international conference to support the population of Lebanon, co-hosted by the President of France, His Excellency Emmanuel Macron, and the Secretary-General of the United Nations, His Excellency Antonio Guterres. A year after the explosion, Lebanon is facing a more complex crisis, a slide towards the collapse of Lebanon's political and socio-economic model. Already, according to the United Nations, one and a half million people can no longer afford their essential needs. Australia fully supports international efforts to assist with the Lebanon Reform, Recovery and Reconstruction Framework, known as 3RF, which aims to help Lebanon achieve three central goals in response to the Beirut port explosion. Firstly, a people-centred recovery that returns sustainable livelihoods. Second, the reconstruction of critical assets and infrastructure. And thirdly, the implementation of reform to help restore people's trust in government institutions by improving governance and accountability. 
Australia's assistance package to Lebanon of $15 million, channelled directly through international organisations and NGOs, has assisted Lebanon's direct needs and contributes to a range of additional imperatives, including supporting displaced Syrians and Palestinians now living in Lebanon. As we all know, Australia is home to around 230 citizens of Lebanese heritage, many of my friends in Sydney, part of this vibrant diaspora, and around 20,000 Australians are living in Lebanon. What happens in Lebanon affects us here too. I know how deeply they felt the tragedy of the bomb blast. The Lebanese diaspora in Australia of all faiths, including Christian, Muslim, Druze and others, has been incredibly generous in its donations to international organisations, to NGOs and charities as a way to assist those in Lebanon. And I want to acknowledge this warmly. I've had many meetings with the Lebanese communities in Australia. I'm indebted to their tireless efforts, particularly those of Bishop Tarabay, Bishop Antoine Tarabay, his broad parish and his excellent advocacy for reform and accountability in Lebanon. I also wish to acknowledge the ambassador to Lebanon, Her Excellency Rebecca Grindley, and all her staff who suffered through the explosion themselves with their families but returned immediately to work despite what had happened to them, to the city they had made, in which they had made their home, to help Australians in need of consular assistance and to work with the Lebanese government and our international partners. Mr President, there is a great deal of work ahead of the international community and for the Lebanese people. If we are to avoid the tragedy of the Beirut explosion becoming an even greater tragedy for all of Lebanon. And Mr President, Australia will continue to play its part in helping Lebanon with humanitarian assistance, with meaningful reforms, with better governance and with genuine accountability. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate and I thank also the Minister for her positive response to my suggestion we mark this tragic anniversary in the Chamber today. And we join with her in the comments she's made. On this day one year ago, Australians were horrified by the images of the Beirut port explosion, an explosion more powerful than the one that destroyed the Chernobyl, Chernobyl reactor killing over 200 people, wounding thousands more and wreaking untold damage across the city of Beirut. Tens of thousands were made homeless and the city remains scarred by this blast. Its reconstruction hampered further by, of course, the COVID pandemic and Lebanon's economic collapse. The young, youngest victim of the blast was an Australian, two-year-old Isaac Olus. And Isaac's mother, Sarah Copeland, describes her loving and affectionate son thriving in Beirut, already picking up Arabic and French to the delight of locals. And our thoughts today are with Sarah, her husband Craig and their loved ones as they mourn again their loss. Isaac's portrait is memorialised alongside over 200 victims of the blast in downtown Beirut. And we will not forget them. The opposition also salutes the vital work of our embassy in Beirut throughout this crisis. Australian embassy staff were themselves injured in this blast, homes destroyed and their workplace damaged. But under the leadership of Ambassador Rebecca Grindley, they managed to navigate the chaos of the explosion's aftermath to ensure Australians in Beirut were accounted for and help them get to safety. And we thank them for their work. This is a particularly difficult time for Lebanese communities in Australia many of whom are locked down and unable to come together with friends and family. And of course, they remain unable to travel to their homeland to grieve with their loved ones and to help rebuild what was lost. We know that as a country, Lebanon has faced difficult times before, and now it has a challenging road ahead to rebuild its city, its economy, and the trust of its citizens in its political leaders to be transparent and accountable. And this is what the people of Lebanon demand, and it is what they deserve. Regrettably, 12 months on from the blast, the grief and losses felt by the people of Lebanon and Lebanese and communities in Australia have been compounded by the fact that those responsible have still not had to answer for their failures. This was a tragedy that should have been avoided, but warnings were not heeded, and Lebanon is still grappling with the consequences of this neglect. The victims of this terrible tragedy are still waiting for justice, and the absence of justice inhibits healing. Sarah Copeland is fighting for that justice, for a full investigation into how this tragedy could happen and to ensure it never happens again for all the victims of that day and for Isaac. 
So we reiterate our call on the Australian Government to support an independent, impartial and transparent investigation into the explosion. And we st stand with the people of Lebanon, with Lebanese communities in Australia and with the Olas Copeland family in their grief. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I join with colleagues in this chamber a year on from the devastation of the Beirut explosion to mark that tragic event that took so many lives. One of the largest non-nuclear blasts ever known. It killed more than 200 people, wounded over 7,000 and caused horrific damage to the beautiful and vibrant city of Beirut. The blast was so devastating it was felt in Cyprus more than 200 kilometres away. The footage from the blast was so shocking to watch. An entire building destroyed, shockwaves spreading across the city. I cannot imagine what it was like to experience directly. In the aftermath of the destruction, the courage of the survivors was incredible and inspiring. People took to the streets, helping each other among the devastation and the chaos. They shifted rubble, cared for the wounded and did everything they could to look after each other. In the weeks following the blast, volunteers arrived from around the country and further afield, doing what they could wherever they could. We should particularly acknowledge the response of the Australian Lebanese community around Australia, even in Melbourne, which was locked down at the time. People responded with compassion and care, sharing support with the survivors half a world away. While the courage of the community has been inspiring, a year later, many people are still waiting for much needed accountability and transparency over what actually went wrong. Our hearts go out to those who are mourning and who have not yet received answers, and we acknowledge the incredible grief and trauma that they feel. We particularly acknowledge the Australian family of two-year-old Isaac Olas, the youngest victim of the blast, and that family's ongoing struggle for justice. The Australian Greens support calls from many people and organisations for independent investigation conducted by or under the auspices of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The survivors and the victims deserve accountability. They deserve answers about why tonnes of a dangerous explosive chemical were stored unsafely for years. They deserve to know why nobody warned them of the danger. To those survivors who are still grieving, still mourning and still searching for answers, we share your grief at the tragic loss of life and we share your passion for justice and accountability. Thank the Senate. Thanks, Senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note this afternoon of answers given by government senators to the questions asked by Labor senators, and that is all questions asked by Labor senators. As the answers to, or non-answers I might say, given by government senators to questions asked by Labor senators today reveals, we have a massive lack of certainty in re relation to our path out of COVID. This is not due to uh, scientific uncertainty, as the government uh, has tried to argue in the past. It is due to their lack of transparency and accountability for the issues our nation confronts. Uh, only yesterday or the day before, we were hearing from the Prime Minister saying, oh, look, once we get to 80 per cent uh, of vaccination, then we will have a pathway out of lockdowns and an end to lockdowns. And now today we hear uh, that the government is finally prepared to mirror what the Doherty model itself shows, which is that 
Yes, we need high levels of vaccination, but they are not a pathway out of uncertainty of lockdowns. Absolutely, we must have a very high vaccination level in order to uh, minimise lockdowns. But as we see, the Doherty modelling itself, as well as modelling done by the Burnett Institute and many previous iterations uh, of coronavirus lockdowns, well, we have known all along that there is a relationship between locking down and managing the spread of the virus. It's been apparent all along, and yet this government does not seem to have wanted to own up to that at all. We can see that, yes, we are in a race to get vaccinated in order to minimise disruption to the Australian community, but that that does not guarantee a pathway for us out of lockdowns, particularly at a 70 uh, per cent uh, immunisation uh, vaccination rate. If we see 70 per cent of the Australian population vaccinated, which we are way off, way, way off uh, achieving, if we then let it rip when COVID comes into our country, we will see thousands and thousands of deaths. Tragically, we have seen deaths in New South Wales in recent days, including of young people. We know we have to lift the vaccination rates of younger Australians and, in particular, also look regionally at the level of vaccination that's taking place. And again, in answers to questions asked by Labor senators today, the government refuses to be transparent about vaccination rates at a regional level. So how can we have an aspirational target of 70 per cent or 80 per cent to say, yes, it's going to give us clarity about how we manage lockdowns with some efficacy once we reach those vaccination rates, when this government refuses to disclose what the vaccination rates in different communities actually are. It is a complete lack of accountability and transparency. This government's given a contract to Accenture for software maintenance and support. They've paid out $6.6 .6 million. We're paying for Commonwealth data. There's a lucrative contract here. And yet this government will not tell us region by region, how many Australians are vaccinated uh, in each region under their GP vaccination program. We've got better data from the states with their mass vaccination programs, and you can see from those programs and that transparency, for example, in Victoria, that there are regions like Gippsland which have a lower vaccination rate because they're not as close to uh, a large vaccination hub. But what you can also see there is that those very same regions have lower access to GPs and that it is therefore also more likely that they have a lower vaccination rate. And so here we see this Thank government you, refusing Pat, your time has expired. to... to Sen Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, it's great to be able to just free range across all these questions that the uh, Labor senators ask because, again, it, it will give us an opportunity to show just how wrong they are, as always. Um, where do we start? Well, well, let's start with the, the national plan to roll out. The government has set out, based off the clearest evidence possible by one of the most uh, repu reputable institutions in this country, if not in the world, the Doherty Institute, that we will phase out through this as our vaccinations go forward. And, it, and it's clear that um, it's built on the premise that if you get vaccinated, we can make lockdowns and border closures and restrictions a thing of the past, or at least reduce them or restrict them to local areas or to people who aren't vaccinated, for example. So this uniquely Australian plan is based on medical evidence outlined in the Doherty report 
and the economic modelling from Treasury. What seemed to ha happen on that side of the benches, and particularly in Labor states, is they'll look only at the health advice and ignore any economic advice. We certainly saw that in my home state last year in, in Victoria, where 130 days, um, now a cumulative six months of lockdown, has wiped out thousands of businesses in my home state. And to hear the heartbreak of those people who call me every day saying how they lost their business. One of my favourite cafes is around the corner from me in St Kilda had a notice up on its, its door. My wife sent me the photo saying that they just couldn't cope any longer with that last lockdown. It knocked the legs out from them for the, the last time. They're not reopening after the lockdown. This is the tragedy that, that Labor won't see because they've never met a business that they, they, they um, don't hate. So this plan gives every Australian a goal to work towards to, uh, as a target, that, as a country that we can move towards. And then each state and territory must also reach their own targets. And I think the fear in, in most Australians' minds is once we've hit these targets, and these targets and this plan was agreed in National Cabinet, are the states actually going to follow them? Now, we've seen in the past, again, last year in, in Victoria, that the, uh, the Andrews government you know, agreed to things in National Cabinet and then walked out and did completely the opposite. It was woeful. And that's why you know, there's so much devastation in businesses. So many people are lonely, such high um, mental health rates in Victoria. And people are now triggered by the word lockdown in, in Victoria. We've had five. There's cases there today and you know, I have no doubt that uh, the Chief Health Officer is whispering in Premier Andrews' ear, oh, why don't we, why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, go and um, do that? You want to talk about how many months of things? What about the six months that the Andrews government has locked down Victorians? I'll take the interjection all day, every day, Senator Pratt. Come on, bring it on. Well, I would love to debate you on this. Now, you know, if, are you allowed back into your state without quarantining? I don't think so. So keep up the interjections. I'll take them all the time. So, Madam Deputy President, the plan is clear. You know, phase A is where we are now, and we are seeing lockdowns. Phase B, when we hit 70% of adults uh, age 16 plus fully vaccinated, we're making great progress towards this, uh, this um, target with uh, over a million doses a, a week going into the arms of Australians and more in those numbers growing each week as well. You know, the, uh, the stats show very clearly how you know, every million doses that are being uh, uh, dosed out to or given to uh, Australians is dropping. I think it's down to six days for every million last time I looked. Um, so we need to keep increasing these vaccination rates. And those opposite have done everything possible to try and stop people having confidence in the vaccine rollout. They've not got behind the AstraZeneca. They're trying to put thought bubbles out about $300 so people might hesitate and, and not get it so we don't hit those rates. Our national plan will work and those opposite need to get behind it and get behind Australians for once. Thank you, Senator Van and uh, Senator Marielle Smith on remote. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just want to comment briefly on the remarks made by Senator Van before me in this debate, taking note of questions by Labor senators, where he said that Labor has never met a business we don't hate. Completely absurd and offensive commentary from Senator Van, uh, given the nature of debate in this chamber today has been about economic support for individuals, about economic support for businesses. I know I personally have been supporting businesses and business owners through this time who have suffered tremendously because of these lockdowns, not just economically and financially, but in terms of their mental health, who are really, really struggling. And to suggest that I or other senators in this place hate businesses when we are currently trying to support them through something extremely tough and something your government 
has contributed to is horrifically offensive and disgusting. But to the matter at hand, the questions raised by Labor senators in Parliament in question time today that we're taking note of. Can we just look at the facts? Only 15% of Australians are fully vaccinated. 15%. So we know the order of vaccination we need to see to have some kind of roadmap or plan out of this is well above that. We're talking 70, 80% in that, in that frame. We're at 15%. 15%. And Senator Colbeck couldn't even answer the specific questions that we had around the levels of vaccination in certain parts of Australia and in particular vulnerable parts of Australia. He says we're continuing to gather pace, the rollout's continuing to gather pace. Seriously, mate? Seriously? That's the best we've got? You can't answer specific questions about where we're at in the vaccine rollout when we know we need to get much, much higher. I think we need to see less back padding from this government, more arm jabbing. It's ridiculous. We need to get the vaccine rollout on track. We need jabs in arms. That is our ticket out of these lockdowns. These lockdowns which are causing enormous distress in my home state of South Australia and enormous distress, of course, in New South Wales, where they've been going on for weeks and weeks. And there are weeks and weeks at least ahead in the future for them there in New South Wales. Who knows what the future holds in Queensland? When we have a government, when this is going on, who just shrugs their shoulders and says, we'll be right, she'll be right, mate, it'll be okay, we'll get there. Well, Australians are sick of your complacency. Businesses are sick of your complacency. Australians are sick of your complacency and they're sick of your blame shifting. You had two jobs, the vaccine rollout and fixing the mess of quarantine. How are you doing on both of those? Less, back, less, less patting yourself on the back, please, and more jabs in arms. I think that would be a really, really good place to start. What's happened in South Australia recently, our week of lockdown, I know it was only a week and I acknowledge the states around Australia who are going through a lockdown much longer than that, but even one week of lockdown has tremendously difficult impacts on people in my home state in terms of their mental health and wellbeing, in terms of their social connectiveness, in terms of the impact on business and on employment for people who can't work in the home and who don't have a job to go to if their business is shut down, if their workplace is shut down, not to mention the essential workers who do go to work every day to keep our economy moving, to keep us safe, to keep the essential services open during a lockdown at great risk, at great personal risk to themselves and to their families, many of whom who aren't vaccinated, many of whom haven't been eligible for a vaccination yet, who are working on our checkouts in our supermarkets, who are driving our buses and our trains, who are working in essential businesses and essential jobs, who are waiting for this vaccine rollout to ramp up to have the vaccinations available to be able to book in and have their jabs so they can be safe and protected at work. That's what they're waiting on this Commonwealth Government for. They're two pretty simple things. The vaccination rollout and, of course, fixing the mess of hotel quarantine, which is contributing to these outbreaks in the first place. Lockdowns are a necessary tool in combating the Delta variant. I understand that and appreciate that, and Australians do too. But they do expect the Commonwealth Government to be doing everything it can with all the policy levers it has available to it to minimise the impacts of this, to minimise the likelihood of future lockdowns and minimise the impact on the people who are living them and experiencing them. It's not about expecting you to have perfect 2020 vision in hindsight. It's about expecting you to respond to what's in front of you, to do the best by your fellow Australians, to use every lever in your arsenal to fight this and make it easier for those Australians doing it tough. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Brockman. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, I can't help but start by once again calling out the inane comment from senators opposite, they keep using it, that the Prime Minister and the government only had two jobs. I mean, what nonsense is this? It shows a complete lack of understanding, a complete lack of insight in what it actually takes to govern this country, particularly through a pandemic. Now, we can go across the questions that were asked today, but I'm going to stay on the vaccine rollout because there are some key points that Australians do need to understand about the vaccine rollout, in particular how the vaccine rollout, rollout has ramped up significantly over the past few months. 
in March of this year, 770,000 vaccines uh, distributed into, into people. In April, 1.4 million. May, 2.1 million. June, 3.4 million. July, 4.5 million. We are regularly now hitting over a million doses of vaccine administered to Australians each and every week. In the last seven days, 1.2 million. Total doses administered so far, 12 point, uh, 12 and a half million I've got down here, but I think we're actually up to about 12.8 as of today. So every Australian who hear those figures knows that the vaccine rollout has ramped up significantly over the past few months to a point now where in July, as I said, four and a half million doses delivered to Australians uh, across this country. Now, uh, do we need to see those rates continue? Absolutely. But those rates will mean that all those Australians who want a vaccine will be able to get one. 12.5 million doses administered, a million doses a week. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to realise that this will get the job done. Now, have there been setbacks? Absolutely. Uh, and, and the Prime Minister has been absolutely open about this. I myself was hit with one of the changes of advice from ATAGI. I was booked for my AstraZeneca vaccine. I'm going to reveal my age here, which is a bit sad. I don't like doing that. But I, I know, I know, but nobody looks at the internet, Senator Wong. Um, so, um, uh, I, I was booked for an AstraZeneca vaccine, and, uh, and uh, that unfortunately uh, wasn't possible because of the change to TAGI rules, um, uh, and, and I was rebooked for a, uh, a Pfizer vaccine, which I've now had. Now, in, in, in the long run, I will actually be fully vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine before I would have been with AstraZeneca due to the different times between the first and second doses of those two options. Now, they are both uh, very good vaccines, very efficacious, offer a lot of protection to the people of Australia. And as I have done before and as I will continue to do, I urge all, particularly my fellow West Australians, we are uh, uh, sadly a little bit behind on the leaderboard in terms of the rollout. We are a, a little bit behind in terms of the uh, of the progress of the vaccination rollout in Western Australia. And I would urge all my West Australian, fellow West Australian citizens to uh, get their names on those lists, to register for their vaccination and uh, to enable uh, all of us as we move uh, through the roadmap over the next few months uh, to have uh, as much protection for ourselves, for our loved ones, for the communities in which we live as humanly possible. Um, we also have to remember, as we continue this vaccination rollout, that the path taken by the Australian government with the absolute cooperation of the Australian people has saved a, a large number of lives, something like 30,000 lives saved by taking the path we have taken. Now, obviously, it's difficult in the current environment with the outbreak of Delta, and we are again facing these challenges. But I know that the Australian people will step up to the mark, uh, do what is required to be done over these next few difficult weeks and months ahead, and above all, I know that they will register and they are registering for those vaccines that are available. Thank, Thank you, you. Senator Brockman. Uh, Senator Ciccone on remote. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, as I speak to you now, it's been more than 12 months on from the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in Australia. Millions of Australians living under lockdown. And, and just to pick up a remark uh, by Senator Brockman, uh, we're not just a little bit behind, but in fact, Australia is 36 out of the 38 OECD nations. Um, and for the government to sort of just dismiss as if somehow we're doing OK, well, quite frankly, we're not. And if it wasn't for the opposition and others in the health profession putting pressure on the government, we'd still be dead last. Um, and in recent weeks, citizens right around the country have at all, at all or at some point 
uh, being confined to their homes in a very drastic attempt to stop the spread of this deadly virus. And it pains me as I talk today that locals, many locals in my community here in Victoria, to learn just how much of these lockdowns have impacted upon their lives. Families separated, livelihoods hot, lost. But why? Why must it be this way? Why is it that now, over 12 months, that restrictions continue to be a feature of our daily life? As we look overseas, it is not hard to identify what at least part of the answer might be. Countries like the United Kingdom, Canada and Israel tower over Australia in the proportion of their populations that they've been vaccinated. In these countries, as in many others, a new COVID normal has been allowed to develop. One which is for most of the part free, free of lockdowns, curfews and other harsh measures which limit the freedom of their citizenry. There can be no doubt in that a key element of our pathway out of this mess is through vaccination. It's very simple. Sufficiently vaccinated Australians will help end the lockdowns, each inflicting billions of dollars of losses on businesses, both big and small. It will help end the border closures, the constantly cancelled holiday plans, and help us all get back to work. Australia's lagging vaccination rates are hardly a new phenomenon. They have been lagging since day one. Whether it's been insufficient supply, hesitation, or any other concern in between, more needs to be done. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, this week Labor announced another element of its positive alternative plan to help Australia combat and recover from the coronavirus pandemic. It's these incentives that can help and indeed help play an important role in helping us all to get over vaccination rates where they need to be. And by no means is Labor alone in suggesting such measures. Offering incentives has been an important element of many other country plans to combat the pandemic in a positive manner. Sadly, those opposite, opposite have dismissed such measures out of hand. We're not making excuses for their own failings on vaccinations. That is, of course, of course, this isn't the first time the coalition has dismissed Labor's positive suggestions out of hand. Do we remember JobKeeper? The measure credited with saving countless jobs right around the country. Given the, the victory laps we've seen from the government, one could be forgiven for forgetting that this wasn't even their idea. And it's not just that it wasn't their idea, but that when Labor and those in the union movement first suggested it, those opposite also dismissed it completely out of hand. My hope is that the government will once again perform the same about face on this initiative. My hope is that instead of pointing the fingers at others for their own failings, that the coalition will see merit of this suggestion from Labor and implement it. If we are about to get where we need to be, it is imperative, imperative that we get jabs in arms. Any measure that gets us to that point should be entertained. To reject such measures simply because they came from Labor is irresponsible. I call on those in the government to stop the spin and start getting on with the job of keeping all Australians safe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson-Young. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given uh, to me uh, from uh, Senator uh, Birmingham representing the Prime Minister. And these questions were, of course, in relation to what the government is doing and what the Prime Minister is doing to stamp out misinformation and uh, lies, COVID lies, that are being spread by some members of his own team. Now, we heard uh, only a few days ago that YouTube have taken the extraordinary step of banning Sky News for a week because, in their view, Sky News breached their standards, that it was up to uh, YouTube to insist that facts and truth in relation to Sky News's broadcast uh, need to be implemented rather than the lies and the myths and the conspiracy theories that are promoted by a number of members 
who continue to uh, appear on Sky News and be promoted on that platform. Now, here's the question. If this information is dangerous enough to be stopped on the internet, then surely it's too dangerous to be on our television screens. But of course we know that Sky News broadcasts on their subscription service, but also on free-to-air television as well. So what is the government doing to step in and make sure that this dangerous misinformation, this undermining of our health response to COVID-19, putting people's lives at risk, is not getting a flogging on television? Where is our media regulator in all of this? The government's own media regulator sitting on its hands, doing nothing about it. And you wonder why. Well, they're taking their lead from the very top. The Prime Minister, who's doing nothing to sanction and to put, call out and to pull, put into line members on his own bench who have actively been undermining the work of doctors, of nurses, of our emergency service workers, of our essential workers, of the people who day in, day out are dealing with the realities of COVID spreading across this nation once again. And as millions of Australians today are in lockdown and millions more living with restrictions, we've just got a, a, a WA Premier who's just called a snap press conference over in the West. We're all <laughs> holding our breath, hoping that that's not bad news, but we all know it probably will be. This country is in a COVID crisis, and rather than holding whack jobs to account on his own side, the Prime Minister continues to turn a cheek. We've got George Christensen purporting and promoting and pushing COVID lies, undermining the good work of our health officials, undermining the, any success of the vaccine rollout. And we've got government senators like Senator Rennick doing the same thing. Senator Hanson, I, I'm just going to, Hanson Young, please stop the clock. I'm going to ask you to withdraw the word that shouldn't be uttered here, where, specifically when it refers to a member or a senator, and that is the, the word lie. Spreading COVID lies. Um, senator Hanson, I, 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 we adopt, have traditionally adopted a very strict term on the use of the word lies. Um, it is a very slippery slope. I'm gonna ask you to withdraw that. There are other words that can be used to convey the same meaning that we have not you traditionally had such a strict approach to. Well, um, Mr President, I'll withdraw the word lie. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. However, the point I am making is that conspiracy theories, made up facts, self appointed experts are undermining the government's own job from within. COVID terrorists almost. Sabotaging the good work of our health experts. Now, billions of dollars has been spent out of the government coffers in the last 12 months, hundreds of billions of dollars spent to stop the spread of this virus, to help our community stay safe. And rather than helping, we've got members of Morrison's own team Can I, again, undermining and sabotaging. Senator Hanson Young, again, I'm just going to ask people to, re, to maintain the level of debate by referring to people by their titles or their names. We don't refer to people simply by their surname in this place. Mr Morrison is sitting on his hands while members of his own team are running around sabotaging this country's health response, putting at risk the safety of every single Australian. He needs to be a leader and call them out. Order. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Hanson-Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. 
the ayes have it.